So there's this interesting cultural conversation that's been going on the last couple of years, uh, and it, it crosses across lots of different places in pop culture in our society. Uh, who is the goat? And I don't mean like who's the goat, the, uh, the farm animal kind of thing. That's not what we're talking about here. But who is the greatest of all time goat? You guys know what I'm talking about here. It began because of this conversation about NBA stars, legends, who's the greatest basketball player of all time. It started here with Michael Jordan uh, versus LeBron James. Uh, who is the goat, right? And I mean, if you, and if you believe the answer to the question, who is the goat, is LeBron James. Don't worry, there are no perfect people out here. It's okay. We're so glad that you're here, even though you're wrong. Stand there in your wrongness and be wrong, but it's okay. And I think it's a funny thing to talk about who is the goat through lots of different parts of our pop culture. Uh, when it comes to television shows, people argue about the greatest shows of all time. Maybe it's that show that's always on in the background at your house uh, is argument between The Office. You know, any Office people here tonight? Dunder Mifflin. Yeah, D- Dunder Mifflin or S- Sabre or whatever it was at the end. I, as for me in my house, you know, we watch The Office. And then you have friends, any friends people in the house? You know, you and your couch pivoting over there. I see you. Uh, but yeah, so we can argue about that. Uh, there's In our house, when it comes to TV shows, we have a four-year old and a two-year-old, and there's an argument between what to watch every morning with their cereal bar. It's either Paw Patrol or Spidey and His Amazing Friends, and I have those theme songs stuck in my head. They just won't leave. It's terrible. But I thought this would be kind of fun, talking about who is the greatest of all time, what's the greatest of all time, when we uh, consider Christmas, because we all have things we love about Christmas, like who likes Christmas movies, right? We love Christmas movies every year. There's certain movies we watch. What's the greatest of all time? Some people might say it's a Christmas story. Right? Anybody fans of a Christmas story, right? You know, you're shoot your eye out kid and anybody brave enough in church to say they have that lamp in their house? Uh, yeah, the hell, that's amazing. I, that's the first time people have raised their hands with that. I love that. Uh, but for me, the greatest Christmas movie of all time is a no brainer. It's right here. Die Hard. <laughs> and so I've got 10 minutes where I'm going to point by point explain why Die Hard is a Christmas movie and why it's the best. Yippee, Kai. Hey. Uh, anyway, uh, and so we can talk about that, or maybe when it comes to the sweet uh, Christmas treats that we like to eat at this time of the year, because calories don't count around Christmas. Isn't that what you guys have been told to? Uh, anyway, but we might talk. Anybody love the Little Debbie's? Yes, the Christmas tree cakes. Uh, I saw uh, online that some people were making a cheesecake and putting this as the top layer of the cheesecake. Is there nothing that humankind can't do? It's an incredible thing. But for me, it doesn't matter uh, what season it is, if they make a holiday version of a Reese's. I'm completely in. Have you guys tried the trees? They're incredible. The peanut butter chocolate ratio. It's so, so good. It's where it is at. And so, uh, yeah, this is a fun cultural conversation right now. But when we talk about Christmas, and of course, I'm going to you know, show my cards. Uh, you, know, you might assume uh, that I would say this, but I believe that Christmas reveals to us truly the greatest of all time, the one true goat. It's the arrival of Jesus. And so much of Christmas is explaining and telling stories of his greatness when he arrived on that very first Christmas. So much so that his mother, Mary, who scripture tells us was an unwed teenage girl from the boot of society and the underclass, uh, she had this divine messenger in the middle of the night who told her that she was going to become pregnant and carry and give birth to the king of the cosmos. (laughs) And if as that pressure wasn't enough, the angel angel senses that she's freaking out a little bit, and the divine messenger tells her uh, this to calm her down, which I don't think he did a very good job. This is what we're told, is told to Mary when she's freaking out. The angel said to her, do not be afraid, Mary. You have found favor with God. You will conceive and give birth to a son, and you are to call him Jesus. In other words, Mary, put away the baby name books. It's going to be Jesus. We can move on now. Uh, he, He will be great and will be called the son of the most high. The Lord God will give him the throne of his father, David, and he will reign over Jacob's descendants forever. His kingdom will never end. Talk about high expectations, right? Like great expectations about the legacy and the legend of what Jesus would do and how it would begin and never end. And this Christmas... What I am being so captivated by, what just stopped me in my tracks and knocked me out, is how you consider the greatness and how Jesus lived out this greatness. It surprised the world in the first century. I think it could still shock us to our core because it revealed greatness, but it it showed us a whole different way to understand greatness. That's where I want to take us tonight. We'll put it this way. This is where we're going. 
I believe this to be true, that Christmas reveals and reverses what true greatness looks like. It reveals to us what true greatness is, but it's an upheaval. It's upside down from what we would assume it actually looks like. And you see, in the world that Jesus was born into, there were a couple people that were known for greatness. And what the scriptures do is it gives us a contrast. It gives us a choice between what kind of greatness we truly believe in and what kind of greatness we'll follow and emulate in our lives. So what I want to do is I want to take a couple of the characters from the Christmas story that usually live in the shadows, and I want to put some light on them because I think we see in them this contrast of what greatness was because these people were known as true greatness. First person I want to take a look at tonight is a guy by the name of Herod the Great or King Herod. He enters into the Christmas story, Matthew's account of the Christmas story, starting in verse 1 of chapter 2. This is how Matthew wants to set the stage for all the, the story of Jesus' birth. Jesus was born in Bethlehem in Judea during the time of King Herod. Here's a statue, a sculpture of what King Herod might have looked like. Checks notes. He did have arms, apparently. Something must have happened to this sculpture. But Herod is a fascinating person in human history. I mean, this is all extra biblical accounts by secular um, archaeologists and historians. But um, historians agree that he is one of the richest men who ever lived. His income, his personal income was 100 times what the GDP of the nation that he ruled brought in. He got his wealth from the spice trade that he inherited from his father and his grandfather. He's a trust fund baby. You can trust him, right? That's where he got his wealth in that way. I mean, Elon Musk would be the guy to mow Herod's lawn. It's fascinating because everything that Herod touched, history tells us, had to be bigger, brighter, shinier, more coats of gold. There had to be a mystery around how did Herod do it? He built these big, amazing things in the ancient Near East, but he asked his engineers to destroy their plans and the designs so people in the future like us would just sit and marvel at, oh, Herod was so great. How did he do it? Herod loved his luxury and he loved living in opulence and wealth, so much so that he had this massive palace in Jerusalem where he reigned from, but he liked to get a a little weekend home. There's one place about a 10 day journey away from Jerusalem called the Masada, where he he, he, uh, enlisted his team to build him a palace on this terrace overlooking the desert on top of this mountain. This is what it looks like today, the ruins of the Masada. And it was this beautiful place with this incredible view that Herod had built for him. But what's most fascinating is what was going on underneath the surface. See, engineers today still marvel and they wonder how in the world Herod did it. But there was an intricate water system and cistern system to where cool water was accessible all the way from the bottom of that mountain all the way to the top of the terrace. They could get cool water on demand. 17 of the world's largest 21 cool water cisterns were found inside of this structure. And you can imagine what cool water meant in this culture and in this climate. It meant the height of luxury. It meant that you could get whatever you wanted whenever you wanted it. And Herod had it at his fingertips any time. He wasn't just satisfied with one little weekend getaway. He went to the other side of Israel and he wanted another palace on top of a mountain, but there was only one problem. There was no mountain in that area. So this is what Herod did. I want a mountain. And his team of engineers literally made a man-made mountain to put a palace on top of. It looks like this today. It's called the Herodium. Do you guys, if you've lived in Kokomo a long time, remember Lance's pit? Lance's Pit, like, I remember marveling at it when I was a kid. I'm like, they made that lake? That's amazing. This is the Herodium. It's quite a little bit bigger, right? (laughs) But he wanted to have another palace on top of a mountain, so they created one for him. And what's amazing when you consider the opulence, the wealth, the luxury of Herod the Great's life is that Jesus was born 3.1 miles away from the Herodium. In other words, in the shadows of the Herodium, in a stable or a shepherd's cave, in a feeding trough, among animal smells and the lowliest people in society, God planned to bring his son into the human story. 
in the shadows of the Herodium. And I'm just crazy enough to think God did it on purpose because God was starting to explain that there's a counterfeit greatness and then there's a true greatness. And Jesus is going to bring this contrast, true greatness. Christmas begins to tell us that true greatness doesn't come with a new car smell. It's not measured by wealth. It's not measured by social media influence. It's not measured by how many people report to you or how many letters you have after your name. It's an upside down kind of greatness of an upside down kingdom led by a king who loves to turn things upside down. Jesus' mother, who again was this unwed teenager from a no-name family from this town in the ancient world that had a terrible reputation. Nazareth, what good could come from Nazareth? That's Mary's hometown. And she just finds herself all swept up in this thing that God is doing to where she's found herself at the bottom her whole life, but somehow God is lifting her up. She goes to visit her aunt Elizabeth to share about what was told to her through this divine messenger. And she's just got this song in her heart. She can't help but sing. And it's a song of praise. It's a song of God, what are you doing? And how am I included in this great story you're writing? It's recorded for us in Luke chapter one, starting in verse 51. This is what Mary, the mother of Jesus, sang in light of this upside down greatness. She says, God, he has performed mighty deeds with his arm. He has scattered those who are proud in their inmost thoughts. He has brought down rulers from their thrones, but have lifted up the humble. He has filled the hungry with good things, but has sent the rich away empty. He has helped his servant Israel, remembering to be merciful to Abraham and his descendants forever, just as he promised our ancestors. Mary discovered something about the character of God and the kingdom way of God, that it's upside down greatness. Do you know this passage, this song that Mary sang is illegal to be read publicly in different countries today because it's considered revolutionary. And to that I say, oh yeah, it is. (laughs) You see, this is good news if you're on the boot of society. But this is bad news if you're someone like Herod, who is proud, who is never hungry, who is at the height of luxury. But Mary starts to realize that God is up to something new. God is up to something different. God likes to work in the upside down kind of ways. Mary understood that Christmas doesn't equate greatness with might, pomp, circumstance, Greatness is small, it's seemingly insignificant, it's well-loved or used. It's not silver and gold presents stacked to the ceiling. It's small, and it begins to change the world. But everybody's got a boss, (laughs) and Herod the Great was installed as a king over Israel, over Judea during this time by a character by the name of Caesar Augustus. And Luke introduces us to Caesar Augustus as he sets the background for the Christmas narrative in Luke chapter 2, verse 1. Luke tells us, in those days, Caesar Augustus issued a decree that a census should be taken of the entire Roman world. This is the greatness that was on display over the Roman Empire and the world that Jesus was born into. Here's a picture of a statue of Caesar Augustus in one of the many palaces and temples that was built in his honor. And it's a fascinating thing about Caesar Augustus, how he became the very first emperor of the Roman Empire. You know, yeah, that Roman Empire that all the men have been thinking thinking about seven times today already, right? This is how Caesar Augustus came to power. His father was Julius Caesar, the last leader of the Roman Democratic Republic, the last dictator, if you will. And he was stabbed in the back, which created and killed and created a power vacuum over the Roman Empire. And everybody's like, who's going to take the throne? Who's going to lead? Is it going to be Mark Anthony? Is it going to be Caesar Augustus, Julius Caesar's son? Who is it going to be? But a fascinating thing happened during those seven days after Julius Caesar was killed. There was an astronomical event that's recorded extra biblically. For seven days, there were comets that shot across the sky. There were reports of it from China all the way to modern day Scotland of these comets that were bursting across the sky. And Caesar Augustus he was good at marketing and PR because here he is, his father has just passed. He wants to take the lead over the Roman empire. And he says, you know, that comet that was in the sky, you guys, that was my father, Julius Caesar. He was divine. He was a God. And look, he's ascending to heaven. 
My father, Julius Caesar, who's dead, was a god. And what does that make me? Makes me the son of a god. And he started spreading this message around that he was divine. And then all the public made sure that Caesar Augustus took the throne over the Roman Empire. And this is where Roman emperors began to be worshipped, not only as great leaders, but as divine beings. Caesar Augustus was known as a son of God. And if we read the headlines about Caesar Augustus that were going on at the same time that Jesus was born into human history, it's fascinating. Uh, There was this poet named Horace, and poets during this time in the Roman Empire were kind of like the lead pop singers of the time, and Horace was the official uh, poet, lyrical poet of the Roman Empire during the reign of Caesar Augustus, so he's basically Taylor Swift. And this is what Horace said about Caesar Augustus in one of his poems. Thine age, O Caesar, has brought back fertile crops to the fields and has wiped away our sins and revived the ancient virtues. And the fame and majesty of your empire were spread from the sun's bed in the west to the east. As long as Caesar is the guardian of the state, neither civil dissension nor violence shall banish peace. That's terrible poetry. It doesn't even rhyme in English, right? But anyway... There's some uncomfortable things that are said there that Caesar Augustus can forgive sins, wipe away sins, that he's bringing peace to the world that no violence could ever banish. This is what was thought about Caesar Augustus because he was the divine son of God. There's another piece of archaeological findings called the Priene calendar inscription. This is found in modern day Turkey in the back of a marketplace around this exact same time that Caesar Augustus reigned. And here's what it looks like. So we'll just read it from here. You guys take it from the left. Um, I'm just kidding. This is what it says in English, some excerpts from the Priene calendar inscription. Again, this is extra biblical, but this is what was going on at the time that we believe Jesus was born. Say so sending him as a Caesar Augustus as a savior both for us and our descendants, that he might end war and arrange all things, bring peace and bring order to chaos. Since he, Caesar, by his appearance, excelled even our expectations, and since the birthday of the god Augustus, that's a little awkward on Christmas, right? The birthday of the god Augustus was the beginning of the good news for the world. All of these were headlines about greatness, the leader of the biggest force in the world, politically and militarily, all before Jesus was born, right around the time that Jesus was born. And here's in list form, this is what was said about Caesar Augustus, that he was a divine son of a God. He was there to bring peace to the world. Now, of course, it was peace by wielding a sword or crucifying your enemies, but it was peace, right? (laughs) salvation for humankind. He was wiping away your sins, Horace told us, forgiveness forgiveness of sins. And he was bringing good news for all people. Now join me, my friends. We should all feel a little uncomfortable right now. Let's step into the tension of what we're seeing because all these things are, if you're a follower of Jesus, these are all things that we hold near and dear theologically and personally about the person of Jesus. And they're all said about somebody else before Jesus was even born. What's going on here? Don't freak out. Take a deep breath. See, all these titles, they were all common language for power and greatness and about Caesar. And the authors of our New Testament, the authors of our New Testament are so divinely inspired, so brilliant. The messengers that God sent were so inspired and brilliant that what they're doing is they're setting up a contrast. They're setting up a goat conversation of who is the greatest of all time. Setting up a choice that you and I have to make about who we're gonna follow and what way we're gonna follow with our footsteps and the way we live in our lives. Will it be Jesus kind of greatness or will it be Caesar's kind of greatness? My friends, what if God is saying, all these things that you're looking for in Caesar Augustus, It's counterfeit. It's not the real thing. I'm going to show you a better story, the real story, the real good news. And that's exactly what I think the Christmas narratives and the scriptures do for us. Now, with all this in mind, all these words and phrases that are tied to Caesar Augustus and what power and greatness looked like in the ancient world, let's read the Christmas narratives again and let's see some things explode on the page for us. This is what the angels say to the shepherds the night that Jesus was born. The angel said to the shepherds, do not be afraid. I bring you good news. 
He's like, you've heard of good news of Caesar Augustus, right? The good news for all people. Lean in, I'm gonna tell you the real good news, a better good news that will cause great joy for all people, not trepidation and fear if you don't bend the knee, but this is gonna cause great joy, spark joy inside of all the people. Today, in the town of David, a savior has been born to you. A savior, a savior who actually is going to bring order to your chaos and is going to bring you a peace that goes beyond just your present circumstances. But a savior has been born to you. He is the Messiah, the Lord. And you can imagine the confusion of these shepherds that are hearing this. They're like, what are you talking about? Like, you're talking about like Caesar Augustus is here. He's in the town of David. What are you talking about? But you can imagine they're starting to think maybe there's someone greater than Caesar Augustus. And he's going to be born right here. He's the Lord. And they're like, okay, how's this Jesus going to enter the scene? If he's going to be greater than Caesar, like think about those Advent ceremonies with all the pomp and circumstance and the symphonies and the choirs and the war horses and the chariots. What's this one going to be like? It's going to be bigger and badder and better than anything we've ever seen. And then the angel tells us how this savior is coming into the world here. This will be a sign to you. You will find a baby (laughs) wrapped in cloths, lying in a manger. No pomp and circumstance, no chariots, no warlords leading a parade. You'll find a baby lying there in human frailty and vulnerability in a shepherd's cave, in a feeding trough, true greatness on display. It looks nothing like Caesar Augustus wielding his sword. It's so much better than that. Early followers of Jesus, after Jesus lived, his death, his resurrection, and his ascension, they they kept the movement going, and they kept gathering together and kept spreading this message of Jesus because they believed that Jesus rose from the dead. And they would gather in homes, and they would break bread together, and they would uh, read scripture together, and they would pray together, and they would actually sing songs together. And many biblical scholars believe that one of the songs that early Jesus followers in the first century sang together is recorded for us in our scriptures in Philippians chapter two. And listen to what this song says about the upside down greatness of Jesus. Jesus, who being in very nature God, did not consider equality with God something to be used to his own advantage. In other words, every room that Jesus ever walked into, he was the most important person, but he didn't like have the trumpet blow. Look at me, I'm the son of God. No, He didn't use it to his own advantage. Rather, he made himself nothing by taking the very nature of a servant, being made in human likeness, and being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself. Do you know in the Greco-Roman world, the idea of humility was laughable. It was a sign of weakness, even though it's cherished today in our society. But it was a sign of the lowest humiliation to be humble. This is what our Jesus did by becoming obedient to death, even death on a cross. My friends, ponder this. How did Caesar Augustus bring peace to the world? It was through wielding a sword, making others bend their knee to him, or crucifying them on a cross to strike fear in the heart of everyone who dared stand against the might of Rome. How did Jesus bring peace to the world? He looked at the same cross, but he didn't put his enemies on it. He willingly gave himself up in an act of self-sacrifice and love and restoration. And because of all that, greatness is on display. The song continues. Therefore, God exalted him to the highest place and gave him the name that is above every name, that at the name of Jesus, every knee should bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth and every tongue acknowledge that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. This part begins with therefore, because you're looking backwards in what we were just talking about. And the song is telling us what's true greatness actually look like. True greatness looks like humility. True greatness looks like sacrifice and service. Putting others first, true greatness looks like love. And it's upside down. But Christmas reveals to us that's exactly what true greatness looks like. It looks like love. And remember where we've been this whole time. Reminding us of this. That Christmas reveals and reverses what true greatness looks like. 
And I know we've, we've gone a long way today. We've done a lot of work together. But I think because of all of this, I think there are two things. I think there's a beautiful invitation that I want to encourage you to live into. And there's also a robust challenge that this is the fifth time I've given this sermon of the last two days, and I am unsettled with the challenge. And because I love you, I want to encourage you and unsettle you all together. First, this is the, the invitation I want to invite you to live into, to understand. I want to encourage you, don't let your limitations disqualify you from God's family. Don't let your limitations, your negative life circumstances disqualify you from God's kingdom, God's movement, what God is doing in the world. Come on, hear me. This Christmas, uh, you might be here and you feel small. You feel insignificant. You feel like just a cog and a big machine. You feel less than. This Christmas, you might feel like you're not good enough morally. Like you're like, walking in, you're like, I'm surprised the building hasn't fallen over since I'm here. And I don't know exactly what a Christian's supposed to do, but I know I'm way on the other side of that. And you feel like you're out of bounds morally. Maybe for you, you feel inferior financially and you're thinking about Christmas and how you're going to afford it and how long it's going to take to pay it off. And you just look at other people and you're like, yeah, I'm so far away from that. Maybe for you, you feel too spiritually gone, like you've shut off the part of your heart, your spirit, your mind from even being open to spiritual things. And perhaps maybe for you, when people describe Christmas and we sing the songs like silver and gold and this cozy Christmas atmosphere, sacks of presents to the ceiling, the perfect family meal, the perfect family picture, you're like, yeah, that's just not me. I'm not good enough for that. I, that's not my life. <laughs> Hear me. Perhaps you are closer to the original spirit of Christmas than you could ever imagine dare I say, you're knocking on the door of what the kingdom of God looks like. And you're what Jesus would call blessed in the midst of it. Just consider this. Who are the people that Christmas was revealed to first? That this whole arrival of Jesus was revealed to first? First, it was the shepherds, the dirty, outcast, poor, working class shepherds. They didn't even hang out with people. They just hung out with sheep. They were looked down upon uh, all throughout the first century. But God comes to them and tells them that they're going to be a part of this mysterious, powerful miracle of the arrival of his king. And I'm just crazy enough to think that God did it on purpose because <laughs> he wants to show us that he's doing a different thing, an upside down kind of greatness. Next, we hear that there's this strange group from the east called the Magi, or is that bad Christmas song, the We Three Kings, that group. These are some people that they're into astrology. They're looking at the stars, trying to tell what's going on. They're not part of God's people. They're not students of the scripture. If there was a theology test, they would miss every single question. And religious people today might be like, we need to keep those people out. They don't belong to be part of the story. But God intentionally brings them in because they're seeking. And God's always including the outsider when they have an inkling of seeking in their heart. You guys, the greatness that is on display at Christmas, this one true king, the goat, doesn't exclude you from his presence. He doesn't exclude you from his story. So don't exclude yourself. You are closer to the original spirit of Christmas, the small, the insignificant, the backwaters. You're closer than you can possibly imagine. And the challenge that's been so unsettling to me that I want to lovingly bring to you is based out of this question. What brand of greatness are you running after? What brand of greatness are you wearing? What style of greatness are you basing your life off of? You see, our culture, our society it will bait us and will push us towards Herod greatness and Caesar greatness all the time. More and more, uh, climbing higher and higher, growth at all costs. People are to be used for our achievement. And if they're in the way, we throw them off the bus or run them over with the bus. Comfort, fun, freedom, pleasure. It's all mine. I deserve it. I'm living to get more for myself. That's Caesar power. That's Herod greatness. But hear me, because I care for you, and I've lived in this struggle. It's a dead end. It's exhausting. It's a treadmill that never stops. It won't fulfill you. But Jesus' greatness, to fashion your life, 
to model your life off of Jesus' greatness, that's where the life is. Humility, lowness, service, generosity, and open-handed living, extending belonging to the outsider. Forgiveness even when it's hard. Kindness when it's inconvenient. There's no striving, but we live out of an identity that's unshakable as his beloved and good and enough. And that's where the life is. And you have a choice to make tonight. And you have a choice to make every day. I have a choice to make tonight. And I have a choice to make every day. Will I brand my life after the greatness of Caesar and Herod or of Jesus? And how we answer that question, it'll change the trajectory of our lives. It'll, tr- it'll change the story that our lives tell. It'll change the stories that other people tell about us when we, they stand up at our funeral. That's part of the challenge of Christmas and the challenge of what Christmas does is it reveals and reverses what true greatness looks like. See, ultimately Christmas is about a king on a throne, but it doesn't look like the Roman emperor sitting in his imperial palace. It doesn't look like an iron throne made out of swords built by death and conquest and war. It doesn't even look like somebody sitting behind the resolute desk in Washington, D.C. Oddly enough, it combines two images that really display power and glory and greatness. Christmas reveals our King Jesus sitting on a manger throne. A manger throne. And if you want to find Jesus this Christmas season, if you're seeking after the divine, If you're seeking after greatness and significance, you're gonna find it in this upside down power, upside down greatness with our King Jesus reigning from a manger throne. I hope you'll seek him there because that's where the life is.